Hi, I'm Exo, and I'm sorry I missed a video yesterday. This week has been very busy uh, and hectic. I'm still unpacking from my camping trip. I still haven't got my table and everything set up to record from. <sighs> Rather than try to rush through all that and make content that is uh, worth a damn and, and steal a topic away that deserves time, I'm just going to go ahead and do a few more stories this week, and uh, that gives me time to focus on the version 6 release that we have uh, had in progress for the last three years, and we are getting very, very close uh, to wrapping up, um, and it also gives me time to focus on some things around here. Uh, this whole YouTube thing is very new, uh, but I know that if I let it lapse, it'll become very easy to let the to miss a day, and I really don't want to do that. I'd rather keep it consistent and... Um, and hopefully useful, and if not useful, entertaining. Uh, the story I've got that came to mind this time, uh, when I... <laughs> so I was working at Software Etc. the day that a fairly infamous game was released. Uh, it's one that you all know probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, Superman 64. Uh, this was a game for the Nintendo 64 that was uh, ostensibly a Superman you know, simulation, you could fly, you shoot laser beams out of your eyes, and uh, I don't remember why, but it had a lot of hype behind it. It never crossed my radar as anything interesting before it came out. I wasn't really aware of it or thinking about it. Um, however, the morning the game came out, uh, I remember coming on shift, and we had a small line of people out front to pick up the pre-orders, which, not incredibly uncommon, but usually be like one or two people to pick up a pre-order on release day. This is a, was a software center inside of a mall, too. So uh, to go in and wait inside, it was a little more uncommon, I guess, than if we had been a standalone store. So this time there's like seven or eight people in line for this game. And we come in, and they're, you know, hold on, we're going to get the store turned on, we get the lights going and everything, and all right, come on in, we sell them. By 10 a.m., we'd probably sold 50, 55 copies of the game. At least 12 copies, because I was counting at that point, were to children that were should have been in school. <laughs> so clearly their parents had like given them the day off and took them to pick up the game. They got to stay home that day and, and play the Superman 64 game they were so excited about. Now again, I wish I understood why people were so hyped about that game. I, it must have been like a Nintendo Power or there must have been some big previews about it. Some For some reason there was excitement about the game. About 11, our first customer walks back in the door and uh, just walks up and says, I'd like my money back, please. And w giving money back for a game back then was not policy, especially not a full refund. You, you could sell it back to GameStop. Well, we were still software, etc., but at this point, I think they were under the umbrella of GameStop, or if they hadn't been bought yet, they were going to be bought soon. So their business model had already kind of changed into a lot of used games like uh, GameStop had. So... You know, we kind of hem and haw a little bit, like, well, I don't know. But while we're discussing the return of the game, two more people come in the store and they get in line and they're holding their copy of Superman 64 in their hand. Um, we go ahead and process the first return and then, because we see there's something going on here. And we're in the middle of talking to the second person when a company wide email comes through. And it basically says, please. Except, well, not please. It just says, accept all Superman 64 returns, full cash refund, or original payment payment type refund. No questions asked. Just take it. I never saw that the entire time I was an employee at any store that sold games. I never once saw just take, just give their money back. Uh, so as time went by and people started talking about that game and the debacle it was, I mean... I really do think that Superman 64 was probably the 90s version of E.T. in the 80s. It was a game that, like, it didn't kill off an entire console the same way, but I also don't think that E.T. killed off the Atari. I think Atari killed the Atari by producing more systems and games than there were actual consumers that wanted their product. They, they clearly were overly bullish about uh, the prospects that Christmas season and thought that not only would everybody who has an Atari buy a copy of E.T., but like 3 million more people would buy an Atari just to have E.T. I mean, kind of delusional, honestly. 
Uh, to this day, though, whenever I see a copy of Superman 64, I picture that depressed little line of children. <laughs> Just like, I took a day off school for this. <laughs> like, they're so excited. Uh, and, uh, man, I, I, it makes me laugh how... I guess the funny part of it is I, we all can relate to it in some way. There was something that we waited for as kids. There was something that we were excited about that we waited for. And when we finally got it, it just wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, thinking back to my time, I finally I got a job. I'm making money now. I'm not having to ask for games for Christmas or for birthdays anymore. And I'm going out and I'm buying my own games. And I'm realizing very, very, very quickly that the value of a game compared to how much a game costs, is not always remotely equal. Uh, I have walls of games that I bought back in the day that were absolutely horrendous. And it was like, okay, I need to be a lot more careful with my money at this point because there's only so much of it to go around. And there were so many games to play. And back then, you know, it was like, if I saved up money for three months to buy a game from mowing lawns or whatever I did, that game was going to keep me busy for the next two to three months. You know, it wasn't like these days where I can get a game and play it for a few hours and move on to the next one or buy a $70 game and beat it in two or three days and then move on to the next one. This was going to be my life for the next few months. I was going to play Mortal Kombat nonstop all summer long. Or I remember the day I got Street Fighter 2 for the Genesis, the Turbo, uh, the World Champions Edition. That was like, okay, this is what we're going to do around here for the next month or two. Like everyone who comes over, hey, if you want to hang out with me, I'll be over here playing Street Fighter. Um, and so when we do get those games, or whether it was a game, it could be anything. It could have been a movie you were excited to go see. How many people uh, of my generation went and saw the Mario Brothers movie and then left completely confused? What did I just see? Uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, oddly enough, I didn't intend this, but the, the He-Man movie. It was odd. Uh, none of it takes place in Eternia, probably because it was cheaper to film in America. <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the real world. But um, also because there was this mentality back then that kids wouldn't watch a movie that didn't have a kid in it. So He-Man ends up coming to Earth and then working with a small child. It was almost like a... What was that? Was it the second or the, th the third Iron Man movie? Uh, no spoilers here, but there... Uh, it heavily revolves around Iron Man and a small child working together. It's totally unrelated to anything else that happens in the MCU completely. Uh, the only callback to it is the kid is now grown up and does attend um, a certain scene at the end of Endgame. So I thought that was at least, at least they acknowledge that this thing happened at some point in the past. <laughs> um, anyway, I won't belab belabor the point any more than that. But when I think back to games that were a disappointment... Um, not for myself, but for, from a standpoint of like the zeitgeist, the people that were playing gaming at the time. I always go back to Superman 64, and I'm so glad I was working that morning shift because uh, the while it's not funny to see a child be disappointed and depressed about their game, I can look back on it now, 25 years later, and, and think about the humor in... in uh, there were so many bad Nintendo 64 games. I mean, there were bad PS1 games, too, and plenty of bad Saturn games. But for me, the Nintendo 64 was just like the system that had like a handful, maybe a dozen of these amazing must-play games and just a bunch of shit, a bunch of collectible platformers, a bunch of um, so many collectible platformers. Um, a lot of the same thing. And Superman 64 should not have been a surprise to anybody that it was bad. It was a... Uh, it was predestined to fail. <laughs> That'll wrap it up for this story. I'll be back tomorrow with another one. Thanks.